I can't quite believe it. But it is indeed a Saturday morning and it is nine o'clock. And that can only mean one thing. Yes! It's time for the Monster Magic Saturday Show. Let's do this. Wake up, it's a beautiful morning. Feel the sun shine upon your eyes. Woohoo! Hello, everybody. Wow, has it ever been a bit scorchio this week? Um, I hope you've all got some air conditioning or a fan blowing on you. I imagine the duvet covers have been replaced by some very nice silk sheets. Um, but please sit up in bed, grab a cup of tea, get some croissants, put some crumbs all over the bed to make it uncomfortable later and watch the Monster Magic Saturday show. And first up, we have... Ishihara Test uh, by Liam Levenon. Uh, this came out about a week or so ago. Um, didn't quite have time to sort of get to know it very well before last week's show. Um, this um, has been in my top pocket um, ever since it came in to the shop. The idea is that you ask your participants uh, if they are colorblind or they've ever taken a colorblind test. Um, regardless of their answer, you introduce them to the Ishihara test, which is some colored numbers hidden in some colored circles. And the idea is if they are colorblind, they won't be able to read the numbers. And if they are, they can read the numbers. And you run through the cards one at a time with them naming the numbers, placing the cards in their hand as you go along. You then say, well, that wasn't really the test. The test is what is the color of the backs of the cards? They will inevitably say gray, having seen a lot of gray backs. They then turn them over in their hands to see that they are, in fact, multicolored. It's a great surprise and a shock um, when those cards are turned over. They are turned over in their hands, um, which makes it even better. Um, you end completely clean. Um, I have to say, I love the hook. The hook of the colour blindness, the hook of the test um, is really, really good. And it is a genuine test. So um, Sh 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 Shimbu Ishihara um, actually invented it um, in Tokyo um, in the early uh, part of the 1900s, I think around the 1920s. Uh, but let me show you what the cards are like. So these are the cards um, you get. Um, this is the instruction card. So this tells them what the idea of the test is. And these are the other cards. And um, you can see that they're sort of pseudo-chromatic uh, cards. That's what it's called, or Ishihara plates. Um, absolutely genuine. You can Google it if you want some more information, if you, if you really want to um, play on the idea of this being a genuine test and you are testing your audience. You might want to do a little bit of history, perhaps in the same way that people do with ESP cards all of the time. Uh, and uh, the backs, the backs are all multicolored. Um, and they're really nice. They're nice cards. Um, they don't have to be particularly well printed or on great card stock because you're not doing any slides. This, this is pretty much a self worker. Um, and yeah, and you end brilliantly clean and the surprise is a shock. Um, I love the hook. So the hook of these numbers of being colorblind, um, is just great and it really adds to the presentation. And it means everyone can get involved. So you can actually ask different people if they can see the numbers and so on and really make it into a bit of a group activity. Um, they get put, these cards get put uh, face up into your participant's hand at the end. When you ask them the colors, they will then turn them over and spread and see the multicolored. And that is a big, big surprise. Uh, method wise, there's so little to it. Um, the tutorial is by Liam. It's, um, I think it's probably about 20 minutes long and really there's not much to, to learn. The orientation of the cards when you pull them out of your pocket is pretty much the biggest thing. If you get that right, um, then you are golden throughout. Uh, and the, really the only slight involved, um, I'm going to tell you, is the frustration count, um, which is done in quite a unique way by Liam. And it's kind of really nicely justified throughout the routine. So you don't have the traditional sort of frustration count scenario going on. You're just pointing down at the cards um, the entire time. And that's really, really nice and clever. He does teach various handlings of it. Um, you take your pick, but it's a very, very easy thing to do. And this is just so much fun. It's just, um, it's a great hook. It's a great presentation. It's super easy. Um, they are left with, uh, with cards that they can examine 
in their hands. They've got no idea how the backs have changed. And the subtleties of showing all of the grey, it looks like you have seen so many grey backs um, throughout the routine. You do draw attention to uh, the backs at the very start, but then the rest is all just subtleties to show grey back after grey back. It is one of the most novel packet tricks to come out in a while. Uh, and um, I've been having a lot of fun with it. I think you will have a lot of fun with it too. It is super easy and packs a punch and fits in your top pocket. That is the Ishihara test by Liam Levenon, just $16.99. And next up, we have probably the big one of the week, or the one that's getting the big push from most magic dealers. It is Jupiter by Thomas Bader or Bader. Um, Thomas Bader made a big, a big splash uh, a couple of years ago now at Blackpool when he released Drop. Um, that was a big hit. Um, it's still selling well. This is his latest one from last year's Blackpool. It's called Jupiter. It seems like it should be a trick, but it's actually a utility device, which is pretty versatile, especially if you do anything involving stacked decks and, and things like that. Um, you will find a lot of uses for this. It is a really unique idea and some pretty smart, clever thinking. Um, the effect that comes with Jupiter is that you uh, split a deck of cards in half and you shuffle one half of the deck and put it into the box where it cannot be touched. Your participant shuffles their half of the deck, puts it under the table, gives it a cut, takes the top card, turns it, reverses it, puts it back into the middle of the deck, and then they bring their deck out. You write a number on a post-it note, and then they spread down through their cards to show that there's the one card reversed in the middle. You take your half of the deck out of the box, you spread that across the table, count down to the number you wrote down, and the card at that number matches the card that they turned over. Not only that, there's a big kicker when you reveal that in fact the order that they have shuffled their pack in now matches the order that you had in your half of the deck, and you can deal through all of the cards and they do genuinely match. It is an astonishingly powerful routine. Um, the card matching, the number matching is a brilliant routine in itself. Even if you just had that first phase, it would be a really, really strong kind of a sort of any card, at any number effect. But with the whole deck matching at the end, um, that it really is a drama um, and a jaw dropper for sure. Um, and they do genuinely match. This isn't any of those sort of things where you then just give them a quick spread and say, look, they match and hold them up. They do actually match 100%. So you could deal through all of them if you wanted to, um, but spreading them saves a bit of time. I can't really show you the gimmick as such or sort of how it functions, um, but it, this is this is it. And basically, um, it does come in red bicycle rider back but you can change that. You can make this uh, anything you like. Um, it's not really seen by anybody. Um, it's, it's hidden away, so it's pretty much invisible. So you can change it to whatever deck you like, whatever card you like, or, or just leave it as it is. Um, it only really helps what card this is, um, the very initial bit, um, if you're not pre-set up and you're doing it on the fly, as it were, that is possibly the only time you're really going to be bothered about what card is on the gimmick. You also get a few other bits and pieces um, which um, are useful uh, in the setup and also um, to help you out during the routine if you don't want to do any memory work. Um, you, so you may want to be wearing glasses when you're doing this. The routine itself is actually super easy. All of the dirty stuff is done under the table, as it were, and your participant can freely shuffle, they can cut and they can put any card that they like in the middle of the deck. So it's really, really fooling. Um, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't really know how it was done. It is very, very clean indeed. The actual method of the trick um, is a combination of several principles, but Thomas has combined them 
beautifully and it's really nicely choreographed. Everything um, is justified, every action, every motivation. Um, it's really clever. But the gimmick isn't limited to that one routine. Um, so if you are used uh, to any sort of stat work or prepared that work, um, you will come up with some great ideas for using this. Um, it's the sort of thing that perhaps um, people who've been seated at tables have been doing without this uh, gimmick um, for years, many, many years. This just makes it a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier. Does mean you can do it um, standing up. Um, it's a lot safer. It's a lot smoother. Um, but yes, you could possibly, in all honesty, do um, that Jupiter routine without this um, gimmick. The real advantage of the Jupiter is that you can do it standing up. Uh, you can just approach a table um, and just do it from a standing position, um, which makes it even more baffling. You could possibly do this um, table hopping. Um, it'd be nice at bars, possibly if they're all quite high tables like that. Um, almost going under the table might be a bit awkward at times if you're standing and going under the table and not sitting down. Um, the reset isn't isn't lengthy, um, but you are going to want to go into a quiet corner and set it up. It's not the sort of thing you can do as you're walking from one table to another. Um, but really, for me, it is designed for a more formal parlour show. You will need to provide two decks and uh, the little post-it notepad as well um, otherwise everything else that you need is included and it's a really well thought out uh, project and there's lots of nice little checks throughout um, to make sure everything else is running smoothly and you're in the right position for the whole trick to work so you can sort of relax at certain points going it's fine it's all in, it's all on course the only real drawback is that it needs a table um, you do have to go under the table, but it's the sort of presentation, it's the sort of trick where there's so much going on. You need a table to show all the cards, to do the dealing and to do all of the spreads. So this gimmick isn't going to be the one and only way of you achieving what this gimmick does. It's a brilliant gimmick. It's a brilliant trick if you're seated at a table. That is Jupiter by Thomas Bader. $54.99. And next up, it is Jupiter Prediction. Uh, this is um, a little add on uh, to Thomas's uh, Jupiter. It uses the Jupiter gimmick. Um, you don't have to buy both, but um, you won't really be able to do the Jupiter prediction without the Jupiter gimmick. In this effect, a photograph a prediction is shown well in advance of anything happening, which reveals four cards. You then split the deck of cards into half once again. Each half is shuffled, put under the table and cards reversed. You then swap halves with your participant and repeat the process, both of you again to reversing a card. You then bring those decks out, you spread them across the table, you pick up the reverse cards, so you've both got two, you flip them over and they perfectly match the prediction. Um, I actually think um, I much prefer um, this trick in many ways. It's a bit quicker, quicker. it's a bit snappier um, than the one that comes with uh, the Jupiter gimmick itself. Um, and I love the picture, I love the drama of it, and I love the mirroring uh, that goes on between you and the participants. Um, what you get in here, uh, which is the, uh, is actually the prediction. So the prediction is um, a lovely, we'll also get the instructions. Um, the prediction it's like that. It looks like it's a Polaroid picture. That's the design of it. It's not. It's actually um, just a, a, a printed piece of cardboard, but um, it looks like it's a Polaroid. Um, and people will probably consider it's a Polaroid when you put it down. Um, and they are the four cards. You could, so it is also set up to be the same four cards. You get some gimmicks as well. The gimmicks are in here. Um, you can change these if you want and once you know what they are and um, you can get them so it would be possible to change these four cards into some some other four cards recreate all of this um, if 
you're doing it for friends and family and doing it a lot and you feel that they're going to remember. Method-wise, the trick itself is virtually self-working. Um, these gimmicks and the Jupiter gimmick itself does pretty much everything for you. Um, again, dirty work's done under the table. It looks so innocent. And like I say, the drama, I love holding the four cards over the picture and turning it over. I love the fact that the picture has been in play the entire time. It lets people know, it gives them a clue as to what's going on. It gives them a clue as to where this trick is going, but you're just removing methods as you go along because it is so fair. Thomas does take a little bit of a risk in his presentation, which requires a little bit of audience management or perhaps knowing how your participant handles a deck of cards or how well they handle a deck of cards. Um, you don't have to take that risk if you don't want to. Thomas does explain um, a way around that, um, which will probably go past unnoticed to pretty much everyone. It's just that Thomas prefers the choreography of his uh, way of doing it. I think it's a wonderful routine. Uh, I love the hook of that having that Polaroid um, on the table right from the start to let everyone know the image that you're going to try and recreate at the end. It's one of those things where I think them knowing where it's ending makes the trick that little bit stronger. And the do as I do aspect is great as well. It really does involve your participant and they will go away thinking that I could have turned over any cards. Thomas is teaching um, in the tutorial is only about 15 minutes long is really clear. Um, it's mostly a voiceover. English isn't his first language. Um, so there's not a lot of uh, nuance or intonation. So you have to get used to him sort of almost, I'm guess he's probably reading um, the English out. Um, and it's much better than if I was trying to read any other language as well. So hats off to him for that. That is Jupiter Prediction, $29.99. And now, before I go any further and forget, it's time for the draw to see who won uh, the Grip Stick by Penguin Magic. Uh, great little roughing stick. Here we go. Um, all your names are in here. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm very pleased that someone did say a stick was a sticky thing. Um, I've forgotten who it was now. Uh, lots of lovely entries. Uh, sticky carpet in the pub. Absolutely brilliant. Here we go. Here we go. This is my morning workout. Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Oh, the drama, the drama, the drama. It is uh, David Blaine. Um, there you go, uh, David. Um, please uh, get in touch. Um, send me David Blaine. <laughs> please send me uh, an uh, your address um, to info at monstermagic.co.uk and I will send you the grip stick by Penguin Magic. And now we have Crazy Sam Solve by Sam Huang. Um, Crazy Sam, he has really blasted his way onto the scene by just revolutionising the way other tricks are done quite often. Um, it started with Crazy Sam's handcuffs, um, which was elastic bands. He then did Crazy Sam's mind. Um, he's, he's just, um, his um, fingering, absolutely brilliant stuff. It's sort of new handlings of things with old props and this is his rubik's cube work it's an encyclopedia of crazy sam's cube moves and they look like cgi you've got things like the drop solve um flash solve flick solve um even what i really quite like is the um expansion solve i think that is a really nice idea as well um so it's all about solving the cube in very very visual ways uh it starts off with them sort of explaining so this is the cube you get a cube with it um which isn't a bad thing i'm guessing um as a practice cube i don't know how i don't know whether cubes wear out i don't know whether you'll need it but this isn't the sort of thing if you've never got a rubik's cube before if you haven't got a rubik's cube this really shouldn't be your first uh, uh entry into rubik's cube magic um, it isn't easy. N none of this on here is easy. Uh, it's going to require practice. Um, but when I say it's not easy, it's not like it's difficult. It's not as if um, you couldn't do it with just practice. It just requires a lot of practice. Um, as long as 
you know you've you've got good movement of your your fingers there's nothing to stop you doing it uh really at all um and you just have to practice and practice and practice um that's all i can say i haven't put in all of that practice so sadly i can't demo any of it um but so this cube is a practice cube it's not quite um as good as the rd insta cube which they suggest is the cube that you should use for this sort of thing but again you're probably going to be an experienced cuba at this point and you're going to have your own preferred cube so this one's just a little noisy i think in comparison to other cubes and because you are actually doing um twists and turns pretty quickly um you kind of want it to be quiet the quieter it is the more magical it will be if they hear pieces clunking around they'll know that you've done something um and it'll just look more like a a, a dexterity um, which in many ways Rubik's Cube magic can. Um, sometimes to me it looks like sort of card flourishing, um, but but this looks like CGI solves. So particularly like the drop solve where you have a mixed cube, put it down on the table, it's solved, you pick it up again and it's mixed. Um, really, really clever. Um, the tutorial is about an hour long. It's in Chinese, uh, but it does have subtitles and it is really easy to follow um he sort of does it at speed then he does it in slow motion um and then even even slower so you get to learn the algorithms or at least see what the algorithms are um there it does use that algorithm annotation across the top as well so if you're familiar with the whole r l r prime all of that stuff um it'll be across the top and you can write it down and that's probably very helpful and beneficial. It starts off with a very nice false mix or false shuffle. Um, that's pretty easy to do um, and pretty convincing. Um, if you get as good as Sam at it, um, I don't do it as quick as Sam by any means, um, but I got that far. And then I got quite far through the expansion solve that I really like. That isn't that hard up until um, the last corner solve where you've got to do a couple of twists and turns very very quickly um but that that expansion solve isn't too difficult um really um so it's a nice place for the tutorial to start it then drifts off into um the three-sided uh principle that's got some angles issues so you can't really have anyone you you want people in front of you for that and that section has got the wonderful drop solve in it that i really really like um and lots of other solves, the flick solve, the flash solve. Um, it's a lot of fun playing with that, I'm sure, if you get good enough. And then you have the twisted corner principle, um, which I hadn't um, seen before. Um, and that is a way of making your stack look even more deceptive. So um, a better, makes your stack look mixed better, um, which makes the solve that much more dramatic. And Sam teaches uh, for different solves with that as well i'm um, including one where you put the cube you sort of very quickly do it and you put the cube into someone's hand it's all really really great visual rubik's cube solves that i think visually push the boundaries of anything that i've seen before uh, and then at the end you've got um his uh one cube routine which is really going from one solve to another um, starts off with the drop solve and then ends up with the expansion solve and then you can hand the cube out to be examined at the end um, it's a nice routine lots and lots of eye popping cube magic and finally you have the uh, end thoughts where basically uh, Henry kind of is encouraging you to acknowledge that it's not the easiest piece of Rubik's Cube magic but it is well well worth it and I think it definitely is um you don't have to learn all of the solves obviously and for me some of the hardest part isn't isn't the solving bit it's the stack and the different algorithms that you've got to remember um to get into it and that is just something i, I struggle with if you do rubik's cube magic a lot you're probably much better at remembering um all of those algorithms than i am and it's the sort of thing that you're gonna have to keep practicing and keeping in touch with for the muscle memory as well as anything else if you are a keen rubik's cube mag magician uh, there is going to be some stuff on here that you'll love for sure um it will really really expand your repertoire and you'll have a lot of fun um possibly quite quickly if you are a novice don't get this first um i would say head over 
um, to the Refractor project um, and you know watch some of Kev G and Colin Klaus's work on the Rubik's Cube to familiarize yourself um, and, and just learn all of these basic moves first before leaping in to this. But um, it is really something well worth aiming for in the world of cube magic. Once again, I tip my hat uh, to Sam Huang for um, just showing what is possible with practice and a lot of efforts, uh, you really can come up with some startling visual magic um, and, and new ideas. Um, that is Crazy Sam's Solve 29.99. Next up, we've got Mr. Gloves by Juan Pablo. Uh, I was in two minds about this for so long, and I'm now so pleased that I got this in. Um, it is um, such a charming idea. Uh, what happens is you make a little sort of glove puppet out of a glove, and um, the glove puppet sort of comes to life, and he can help you um, vanish a silk or find a card, um, or you know any any sort of magic trick really um, it really does seem to come to life um, it's a lot of fun uh, it's probably brilliant for children if you are a children's magician you will be able to use him for your change bags or or anything like that um, if you're a restaurant worker and something like TGI Fridays or Frankie and Benny's where you often end up with families it's a brilliant thing um, to have around. Um, I'm sure it is just um, adults will find it just really good fun as well. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't limit it to children. Um, I can't show you exactly what you get. So you get um, you get some gloves basically. You get a pair of gloves and a gimmick. Um, it is a sort of uh, the gimmick I would say is very familiar to pretty much everybody in the world of magic, um, if you've done any magic at all, had any magic set, um, you've seen the gimmick before, um, but it is slightly uh, modified um, to go with the gloves and to go with the puppet. And so you can do any tricks that you, you feel like. If you can vanish that um, silk handkerchief, if you know how that's done, you can really vanish anything else. You'll know what's going on. Uh, Juan Pablo does a nice one with a cigarette where he vanishes a cigarette rather than the silk. Um, I kind of really like the juxtaposition of this sweet um, little hand puppet um, and um, puffing on a cigarette. Um, love it. But don't forget, you can do things like sponge balls with this um, and card tricks as well. There's no reason why uh, Mr. Gloves cannot find a card as well. Um, it's a really, really versatile, really, really sweet idea. Oh, you do get the little eyes as well there. Um, so you can make your glove puppet that much more lifelike. It's that sort of ridiculous whimsy, um, but he does come to life uh, and he is really, really cute. Uh, so people just can't help smile and, and enjoy whatever you have him do. Um, I think it's a really, really wonderful idea. Um, the problem with it is that it is quite pricey um, for what is essentially um, a very simple gimmick and a pair of gloves. But with a bit of imagination, I think you'll get quite a lot of mileage from Mr. Gloves. He is 51.99. There's been so much good stuff in this week. Um, I just tried to make it a mix, um, but really do look at the website. Um, there's follow on there, which is um, a little coin transposition effect. Um, very nice. Starts with a beginner routine, goes on uh, to some more advanced expert stuff, but some nice visual coin magic that's not too difficult to do. And also Frankendo is back. Uh, this was in Roddy's Roddy Boogie's Penguin Lecture. It's a really, really brilliant trick. I'll do a full review of that next week. Um, it is available from me, but it is also available from Roddy himself now. It's been out um, of production for a long time. It's now back. Um, the gimmick is slightly different. I'll do a full review next week, but um, if you do want it, um, then also you can get it from Roddy as well as me at Trick tricktrickboom.com
Also, before I go, uh, I'd just like to do a competition so that you can actually win Jupiter by Thomas Bader worth £55. All you have to do is to leave a comment below saying uh, something strange, weird or wonderful that you have found under a table. Uh, just pop a comment down and I will put your name into the saucepan and see who wins next week. This show is awful, terrible, disgusting. See you next week, of course. But until then, put some sunscreen on, grab some magic and go out and have a lot of fun with the best hobby in the world. Goodbye.